This uh, call to worship is one that I used out in Oregon for six years. The uh, youth group in my church all memorized it. I'm not sure why, it's just what teenagers do. But I enjoy, invite you to say it with me, our call to worship. God sees us as we are. We are young, old, and living in between. We are married, single, widowed, and divorced. We are created gay, straight, and other. We are many races blended together and bound by history and fate. We are happy and sad and sometimes angry or afraid. We are healthy and ailing, strong and weak. We are rich, poor, and somewhere in the middle. We all have abilities and disabilities too. We need one another. We have believed, we have doubted, and still we wonder. So come, let us worship the wondrous one who knows and loves us all.
about you all, but I can feel Peter's spirit here right now. It's mostly because he did all this PowerPoint stuff for me and taught me how to do the technology. And every time I hit the button, I'm saying a little prayer. <laughs> so I hope you feel his presence as much as I do. Yeah, that's my first confession, yes. And as I just proved, all of us have fallen short. None of us are perfect, and we lean on each other. But would you join with me in the call prayer of confession as we confess our sins before God and before one another? Let us pray together. Merciful God, we know that you love us and that you call us to fullness of life. But around us and within us, we see the brokenness of the world and our ways. Our successes leave us empty and our progress does not satisfy. Our promised land is not the promised land of our longing. Forgive our willful neglect of your word and our insensitivity to the needs of others and our failure to feed the spirit that was within us. Through Jesus Christ, amen. When I pray, I often begin with the word gracious God because that's part of my theology and understanding is that we come here to worship a God of grace and of forgiveness, or as somebody once put it, a God who doesn't necessarily keep score. Thank goodness. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Now it's going to get exciting. <laughs> The Old Testament lesson is a lot longer than usual. Are you going to read it to us, or what do you think? We might just let you read it. Because the midwives feared God, he gave them families and daughters. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the fire, but let every girl live. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a woman of Levi the house of Dan. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could not despise him no longer, she got a powerful sorcery and put him in favor with the star of the Lord. Then she placed the child in it, put it among the reeds, and put it on her back and said, His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen. Then Pharaoh's daughter came down to the Nile, bathed, and her attendants were 
walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the weeds and sent her feet out to see to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. She was crying. She felt sorry for the baby. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then her sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to bring the baby for me? Yes, go. So last week, we were blessed are the pure of heart. And I told you I loved it because I like the idea of the heart being as important as the mind. This week, we're blessed are the peacemakers. And I'm going to tell you I love it because it involves doing something. And I often think in our faith life, we do a lot of thinking and maybe not enough doing. Or as somebody once said, perhaps the loneliest word in the Bible is acts. Acts that we do. And I like being, making peace. I want to change one word in the scripture, though, because I think it should say, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Since more than 50% of us are always female in any church I go to, I don't want to just have sons of God. I believe when it says peace, it's a lot more than just the end of war or the end of violence. I like the word shalom, the notion of peace meaning well-being for everyone. And it includes not just absence of violence, but making sure that people have enough to eat, people have health care, people have schooling, that they have a good life. Now, I should have warned you before that Old Testament passage that there was going to be a test. So it's multiple choice, though, that, that maybe you can relax now. In that passage, there's a peacemaker. So. How many of you think the midwife was a peacemaker? I'm going to go through all the characters, and you tell me which one's the peacemaker. The midwife? How about the mother of the baby? Or the sister? Oh, we got a mother. Oh, I should, all of us should vote for mom. <laughs> the sister? The daughter of Pharaoh? The slaves? You guys are holding out for the final one. How about all of them? I really think that all of them had a role in being a peacemaker. And I think that likewise, all of us have a role in being a peacemaker. I brought some stuff to relay my message today. When I was a pastor out in Oregon, a uh, little bigger congregation than the one here, but not much. And uh, shortly after I got there, we had a college student who came to me and said, Dave, we're going to have a vacation Bible school. I'd been there like a week. I went, oh, okay. We don't have any kids, but we're going to have a vacation Bible school, so we'll see what happens. And we had one, and we actually got kids probably like you would do here. Everybody have children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren you could drag in if you had to. That's what they did, and we developed a small thing. And I realized fairly quickly that I knew it before. If you have a vacation Bible school, there's a good chance you're going to have the same curriculum as the church a mile down the road and the church three miles down the road and the church six miles down the road and you're going to have kids come to your vacation Bible school and they're going to say, oh yeah, we did that at the other church. Oh yeah, we know, and we know the answers and you find yourself kind of providing daycare. Anyhow, the second or third year I was there, I found a different curriculum. 
pastor out on the Oregon coast who had served in the Vietnam War had developed a curriculum he called Peace Village. So we bought his curriculum and tweaked it a little bit, and we called it Peace Camp. And we did it for several years, primarily for elementary school kids. We would bring them together in the morning. I'd tell them a story. We'd work on not being bullying. That was a big theme. We don't want you to be bullying. We would teach them about, believe it or not, media literacy. That meant we, we would bring them in, and they'd have on all their fancy clothes and all their fancy shoes, and we would use masking tape or duct tape to cover up the words that were all over their clothing. So they'd be a little more aware of how the world likes to advertise on us. I was fortunate enough to have a wonderful member of my church who was a middle school science teacher and who believed in caring for animals. So she would bring a different animal to peace camp every day. The kids loved the snake. They loved the turtle, but they really loved the ferret. The pastor, that would be me, was not real keen about the baby skunks she brought one time. But you know, they don't actually spray till a certain age. And she had warned me that this would be fine. And I spent the whole night before thinking, how do you actually know exactly how old a baby skunk is and, and when they actually get to the point? Anyhow, we only did that one year and we moved on from, from the, doing that. I invited people from different faiths to come. I had a, a Buddhist leader come one day. I had a rabbi come one day. And the first year we did it, I had a Muslim leader come. We made these shirts. That's why I brought it. This one's about, this used to be yellow, but after 10 years of washing it, it's kind of faded. And we had all these kids wear shirts that said, this side, for peace, and on this side, where there's love, there is peace, peace for all, and lots of different symbols. Uh, there's a dove on one sleeve. This is an example of a peace sign on the other, of what happens when you have a committee design a t-shirt. You get a lot of different symbols. Um, but probably the most exciting part of that first year for me was I had this good Muslim fellow come and explain the Muslim faith to these kids. And we all, he said, what do you want me to teach him? I said, well, teach him about praying towards Mecca. We could step with her. Let's learn how to do that. So he got out a smartphone, which I thought was interesting. Of course, it had a compass on it. He had to figure out what direction was Mecca. So he used his smartphone to do that, and then we all prayed towards Mecca. He put on this nice yellow shirt, and the newspaper came and took his picture. And I thought, how perfect. Because I wanted the world to know that at least in our little congregation, a Muslim was welcome. And I asked the kids at the end of the week, so what did we do this week? Did you do this? Did we do that? Did you meet a terrorist? And a couple of them said, yeah, yeah. And then the rest of them said, no, we didn't meet a terrorist. We met that guy, you know, and my Muslim friend happened to be a computer programmer for Nike. Um, and they learned that there's a little more to life than what you sometimes see in the Conservative churches in my neighborhood had a pastor's group that got together, and they invited me. That I guess I was the token liberal. And we were sitting there one day, and one of them said to me, Dave, what is this peace camp all about? And I tried to explain it to him, and he said, huh. In our church, we teach the young people to be warriors for Christ. Hmm. What are you going to say? Okay. I'm going to keep teaching peace. We... Uh, one year, and I brought this as an example, we had kids from like 5 to 12 or whatever. So for the older kids, I bought them each a copy of this, this copy of the Bible, which is called a Poverty and Justice Bible. And what they've done is gone through the Bible and highlighted in orange all of the verses that are about taking care of the poor or about justice. And in case you wondered, right here are the Beatitudes. And they're all orange. So at least according to this Bible, all of the Beatitudes are about poverty and justice and caring for others. Interesting what I discovered. I, I didn't get enough Bibles for the first and second graders because I didn't think they could read it yet. But the mothers advised me that I'd made a mistake, so I had to go back and buy a whole bunch more of these because all those first and second graders wanted it too, and maybe someday they could read it. We ended the program with a prayer. And those of you who, were, and most of you were here last week, know that I like St. Francis. This is St. Francis' prayer. See if you remember the words. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. 
where there is despair, hope, where there is darkness, light, where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive, it is in parting that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Some churches, some denominations, hold themselves out as peace churches. In the United States of Christ, about 35 years ago, at the General Assembly, they voted to become what's known as a just peace church. The just is one of those funny words. Just can mean only peace, or in the case that they did it, it meant peace with justice. It's not just peace at any cost, but with justice. And that justice, to me, gets back to the word shalom, the general well-being. Well, if I was going to redo Peace Village or Peace Camp this year, it would have a section on Black Lives Matter. It's been kind of a big issue in our country. It's a big issue in our lives. And as I thought about this this week, you know, there was a man in Minneapolis who died when he was put in a chokehold for eight and a half minutes, George Floyd. His crime was using a counterfeit $20 bill. There was a man in Atlanta that was murdered because he jogged through a neighborhood. And of course, there was a woman asleep in her townhouse in Louisville who was woken up by police doing a no-knock warrant and murdered. Her picture will be on the front page of Oprah Winfrey's magazine in September. Rihanna, I got her name here somewhere, Rihanna Taylor. You th I think about those things and think, what happened to our world? And then I had a vision. I heard a story about a 17-year-old boy right around here who borrowed his mother's Mercedes on a Saturday night, 17 years old, to go out with a couple of girls. And of course, what you do around here is you drive up and down High Street in Pottstown. That's what he was doing until one of the girls said she wanted to smoke a cigarette. And 17-year-old boys aren't always the brightest, but this one was smart enough to say, I better not let her smoke in my mom's car or I'll be dead meat. So he pulled over into a parking lot, got everybody out of the car. She smoked her cigarette, and the boy sat down on the curb and started throwing rocks at a bottle. And he got frustrated because the bottle didn't break. So he went over and he smashed that bottle. The only problem was the parking lot that he had parked in was the parking lot of the Justice of the Peace. You all know where that is? It used to be the old uh, train station off of High Street in Pottstown. And as he smashed that bottle, the policeman was driving by. He was a white boy. If he'd been black, I wonder what would have happened to him. But since he was, who knows? I don't know. Who knows what would have happened? In this case, what did happen was the policeman called his parents and said, I'm sending your son home for disturbing the peace. He'll explain to you when he gets there. The boy came right home. A few days later, the boy and his father had to go before the justice of the peace to talk about the incident. The judge said to the boy, did you do it? And the boy said, yep. And the judge said, why? And the boy said, well, it wasn't the most intelligent thing I've ever done. And I think it was that word intelligent that got the judge kind of looked up and he looked at the father and said, what kind of grades does he get? And the father said, well, he actually is pretty much a straight-A student, and it's a little embarrassing to be here because he just got his Eagle Scout badge a couple of weeks ago. And that got the judge intrigued, and he wanted to know about his service project. And then the judge looked at the boy and said, listen, you did it, so I'm going to find you guilty. I'm going to waive the fine. I'm going to count your Eagle project as your service work. Now turn and apologize to your father. For making him take time off of work to come to this hearing. 
Now, if it sounds like I know that story really well, I do because it was my son. And what's interesting, he's now 40 and a math professor with the Air Force. When my son and I were talking about that, oh, a year ago now, it's interesting what we remember because he doesn't remember that part about turn and apologize to your father. Interesting, right? He's a boy. He's 40, but he's still a boy. Um, but when I think about it, I thought as I was reflecting, you know, would he have ended up in jail? In handcuffed? I don't know. But I have a real sense that those words white privilege are real. And that as a country, we need to do more. There's a video. Last week, I suggested a book for you to read. This week, I got a video for you to look up on YouTube called Race in America. It was produced by the guy who does the VeggieTales cartoons. So if you've got little kids in your house, you know VeggieTales. Well, this is an 18-minute video that tries to look at the question of, it begins with the basic question, we know that black folks in America have an income level that's about 60% of what it is for white folks. I don't know that we know why exactly. They have different jobs, they have different educational levels, but their income level is just a little better than a half. Then he raises the issue of the net worth. You know, net worth, how much do you have in assets? The net worth of the typical black family is 10% of the typical white family, or the average. 10%. So it goes through a little bit asking the question, why? So it's a little bit of history, it's a little bit of sociology, and it's a lot of, huh. It talks about, of course, after the Civil War, the slaves were all released, but in the South at one point, Nine states passed a law that said if you're unemployed, you can be put in jail. It was against the law to be unemployed. And of course, there were a lot of black folks that were unemployed, so they got put in jail. Then they passed another law that said if you're in jail, the jail can lease you out. They called it convict leasing. And you could go out and work in the fields and you wouldn't have to be paid because you were a prisoner. So they went from being slaves to being in jail where they still weren't paid. We got through that, and of course then segregation academies occurred. Keep the white kids and the black kids separate. Segregated restaurants, segregated everything. And then we had a housing boom. That's one of the major sources of family net worth, and it might be why black families don't have any net worth, because for 30 years, we were allowed to exclude all the black people from our subdivisions. It was legal. So we had white neighborhoods, even down to after World War II when they had the GI Bill to provide financing. You could financing, but black families couldn't find a house to buy. So even if they had the financing, they couldn't get the house. And there were realtors who could lose their realtor's license if they helped the black family buy a house. Today, the, la the last thing we've done started probably, well, it started with Nixon, was this word law and order. We're going to have some law and order and seize things. We're going to put people in jail. So our prisons have gone from 300,000 people in prison in 1970 to 2.3 million this year. That's a lot of people. And I discovered, and here's two numbers for you to remember if you don't remember anything else from all, this, all these words I'm using. Four and 25. You've probably heard on the news that the United States has 4% of the world's population and 25% of the COVID-19 cases. You heard that? Not something to be proud of. We also have 4% of the world's population and 25% of the world's prisoners. Also not something to be proud of. And the final four and 25, I have a grandson who's going to turn six here in a couple of weeks. He's white. That means as a young boy, he has a 4% chance of ending up spending some time in jail in his life. If he was black, he'd have a 25% chance. Man. 
So I will share with you, the video doesn't have a solution at the end. This is what am I asking you to do? Just one word. Care. That's what peacemakers do. They care. And then they work as they can where they are with their neighbors to try and make it a little better. There's a lot to do. Too much. As last week I shared with you, I like Pope Francis, so I'll tell you what his solution was. He told his priests that they should love their congregation so much. You know, they say that the priest or the pastor should be like the shepherd of the congregation. So Pope Francis told his priests they should love his they should love their congregation so much, they should spend so much time with their people that they start to smell like sheep. Well, that's good advice, but he also says to them, you should spend at least 30 minutes a day in prayer, unless you're really, really busy. And if you're that busy, then you should spend at least 60 minutes a day in prayer, because you're going to need the strength. And I suspect all of us should spend about 60 minutes a day trying to, trying to figure out what we can do about peace and making the world a little fair and regular meditation. I promised, and I'm going to keep my promise, that every sermon would end with a retranslation of the uh, Beatitude. This is how the message says it. You're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. That's when you discover who you really are and your place in God's family. I told somebody once that I only have one sermon. Somehow it always comes back to God loves you and you should be sharing some of that love with others. That's today's message as well. Amen. Oops. That's not the right way. Oh, prayer time. There we go. So, it is time for prayer. I got a pen. What do you want me to pray about? Mm-hmm. Okay. Wow. I think we want to hold up all the people who are suffering with COVID-19. Five million cases so far in the United States. Um, I Googled it yesterday because I wondered just how many unemployed people are there in the United States right now. Anybody know? So, you know, you hear every week that another million people claimed unemployment. But you don't hear the total number. And it's kind of interesting that one source I looked at suggested that there are 20 million people who are unemployed right now. It sounds like an undercount to me because they also said there's about 30 million people collecting unemployment insurance. Either way, it's a big number. Not having a source of income, worrying about the virus is pretty tough. I also know that a lot of kids are going back to school tomorrow or this week. And uh, for many of it, it means they're going to be spending time on a laptop somewhere at home, probably not at school. So let's keep all those kids and those families in our prayers as well. We ready to pray? Let's bow our heads. Gracious God, we bow our heads and we lift our hearts to you, giving thanks. Thanks for your presence in our lives. Thanks for this faith community that takes care of each other. Thanks, O oh Lord, for the sun, for the warmth, for the strength. Thanks for the peace that you give us in our lives, and for our eyes that can see and hearts that can reach out to provide peace for others. 
We know, O oh Lord, that you're the source of all wholeness and healing. And so we pray for all those suffering with the virus. We pray for the doctors and nurses that care for them, that they might be safe while serving others. We pray for those who are unemployed. We pray for the children going back to school, that they might be safe. And we pray for the, our country and its leaders, that they might be wise. We gather here this day as disciples of Jesus Christ. And so we join together in the prayer that he taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'm going to go back and get the offering and bring it up while Judy plays, and then we'll say this is a prayer. And she, Judy looked at me like, huh? <laughs> Whatever is easy. Let's say the words to this as a prayer, dedicating our offering. We can say it together. We give thee but thine own, whate'er the gift may be. All that we have is thine alone, a trust, O Lord, from thee. Amen. I wore this face mask because I thought I could talk through it better. And of course, because when you take it off, you take your hearing aid off at the same time. But I have this UCC face mask, which fit better with today's message. So if I thought I could have talked better through it, I would have worn this. Go in peace. Be of good cheer. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint heart and support the weak. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord.
grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon us all, now and forevermore. Amen.